Hello, Jeff Zwerink, and welcome back to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important and challenging scientific ideas to equip you to be more confident in the truth of Christianity. Today, I'm joined again by my colleague, Dr. Fuzrana, and we're going to ask the question, why is he not a theistic evolutionist? Fuzz, it's good to have you here today. Jeff, thanks for having me. So theistic evolution is a pretty popular idea out there, and, and it kind of has this connotation. If you're a theistic evolutionist, you get to have all the science and be a Christian at the same time. It seems like it's got a lot of benefits to it. But I know you're not a theistic evolutionist. So why are you not a theistic evolutionist? Yeah, and, uh, you know, theistic evolution has been an idea that's been around uh, shortly uh, after Darwin proposed his theory of evolution. Asa Gray uh, Harvard botanist was the first scientist uh, to actually embrace and articulate this idea of theistic evolution. And since that time, people have flirted with this idea, could God have used evolution as a way to create? And yet, uh, you and I, Jeff, are old earth creationists, where we uh, don't necessarily embrace the totality of the evolutionary paradigm, where we see some problems with this idea of God using evolution to create some of those problems are biblical, some of them are theological. But to me, the primary reason why I am not a theistic evolutionist is because I see some very real scientific challenges uh, to uh, the evolutionary paradigm. And so it's for scientific reasons I'm not a theistic evolutionist, primarily not theological or biblical reasons. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting because, you know, I, I know as you read through the Genesis account, there are certainly language that is used there that indicates God uses process to bring about life. I mean, let the earth sprout, sprout, uh, sprout plants, if you will. So there's process involved there. But your idea, your, your comment that you're not a theistic evolutionist primarily because of scientific objections is kind of an interesting one. Kind of flesh out for us, what are some of those objections that lead you to be skeptical of the, science, or of the evolutionary process? Well, to me, the, the, the one primary issue that I have is that evolutionary processes cannot account for the key transitions in the history of life. And uh, the, in the 1970s, the, the late uh, famous Russian geneticist Theodosius Dobzhensky said that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Yet, the evolutionary paradigm cannot account for things like the origin of life. And that to me was really significant because it was the inability of evolution to explain uh, the origin of life that convinced me that there had to be a creator and that opened me up to hearing the gospel. Uh, but so, so is this a sort of thing, you know, we're talking about chemicals and molecules transforming from inorganic inert to life, that there's this big transition. Is this just an area where we, I, I mean, is that a reflection of our lack of knowledge, or is it more than that that gives you pause there? Oh, it's not a reflection of our lack of knowledge. It's, it's really uh, the fact that we're beginning to understand that the chemical processes you need to transform molecules into the very first cells could not happen productively under the conditions of the early Earth. They can happen amply in the laboratory under carefully controlled conditions, but they can't happen uh, on the uncontrolled conditions of the early earth. Uh, but, but that would be one example of a, of a key event in life's history. Well, uh, the, the very first cells on earth would have been what are called prokaryotic cells, cells like bacteria and the archaea. But one of the, the, the next key transition in life's history would be the emergence of what are called eukaryotic cells or complex cells. And this again is a place where the evolutionary paradigm comes up short. The models that are being proposed to explain that transition simply falls short. Another key transition. Can you give us a couple, or at least throw out the names of some of the, the models that are out there. Uh, we well, one, one of them would there. be the, the endosymbiont hypothesis, mm -hmm. for example. And while on the surface it looks like such a great explanation, when you begin to, to, to penetrate and look at the details, uh, you, you wind up um, seeing quite a bit of significant issues associated with that idea that simply look to be uh, insurmountable at this point in time. Uh, another key transition would be the appearance of body plans, where you're going from uh, single-celled organisms or colonial aggregates of cells to, to systems 
uh, that are consist of fully integrated organ systems where you have complex multicellular life forms. So, so, so this is kind of like in the Cambrian explosion is where we're talking about. Yes, the Cambrian explosion is documenting that transition in the fossil record. But even apart from all the uh, peculiarities of the, the Cambrian explosion for the evolutionary paradigm, is this inability mechanistically to explain the genesis of body plans in, in complex multicellular organisms. Uh, another key transition would be uh, the origin of sexual reproduction. Uh, the, another key transition would be the origin of consciousness uh, or the origin, another key transition is the origin of what I would call human exceptionalism. And, and so these are, are key transitions in the history of life that are the key transitions where the evolutionary paradigm comes up short, where experts working in these areas recognize the, the, the very significant hurdles that, that remain that simply are not readily uh, overcome uh, you know, through current understanding of the evolutionary processes. You know, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting point is that there are these mechanisms or these transitions that scientists readily agree are important transitions. It sounds like there's a lot of work has been invested in these. There are ideas out there, but yet the, the models still seem to come up short. And a lot of these seem to be kind of key features that would be ascribed to a creator. I, I, I find that aspect interesting there. Well, what's remarkable to build off of your point, Jeff, is every time you see these transitions in the history of life on Earth, they all happen explosively where there's a sudden appearance of life on Earth. Sudden, it's, uh, the sudden appearance of eukaryotic cells, this is called the eukaryotic Big Bang, the Cambrian explosion, the explosive appearance of body plans in the fossil record. Uh, even with the origin of human uh, exceptionalism, it seems to have a... a it, a Big Bang type event associated with it. And those to me are, are signatures for a creator's involvement. And so in other words, if I would embrace theistic evolution, I, I still would be in the position where I wouldn't have explanations for these key transitions in the history of life on earth. And, and yet when I look at the features of those transitions, not only again, do they defy an evolutionary explanation, it looks as if a creator must have been involved. You know, so, so one, one last question, um, uh, you know, it, it, evolution does seem to explain quite a bit. So, I mean, you've identified some problems there, and I, I, obviously I agree that those are significant problems, but why do we, what do we do with what evolution explains so well? Do we just have to throw that out the window? No, I mean, we can embrace aspects of the evolutionary paradigm, you know, without necessarily embracing the totality of the paradigm. So there's certain aspects of the evolutionary framework that are well evidenced. Uh, and, and so again, I think we can embrace aspects of this, but it's also worth recognizing that in many instances, what people would point to as being the most compelling evidence for an evolutionary history of life on earth, namely the fossil record and the shared biological features that organisms display could also be readily accounted for uh, through a creation model framework where those shared features could reflect not common ancestry, but common or shared design that, that is implemented through the handiwork of a creator. And the progression of life that we see through the fossil record could also be understood as the purposeful progression of a creator who has some kind of ob objective in mind as he's creating life uh, you know, uh, throughout Earth's history. Well, thank you, Fuzz. I appreciate your comments. You know, evolution does seem like this kind of scary topic to talk about. But when it comes right down to it, understanding the definitions are incredibly important. And when you understand those definitions, you actually have some powerful tools to go spread the gospel. You know, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org 2819 and check out RTB's latest book on this, Thinking About Evolution. We'll give you great resources to understand what those definitions are and how to use them to go out and spread the gospel.